Thanks for joining us at Bethel Assembly Online. We all face adversity every day, whether that's in the workplace or in our homes or in relationships. We want to encourage you that God's Word provides the tools that we need to overcome adversity. We want you to look into yourself and know that you have the ability to overcome them. So join us as we step into God's Word today. You know, we've been talking about overcoming adversity, and we're going to continue in that series today. And, uh, you know, I think when you look at adversity, adversity is around every corner. We face adversity when we're dealing with our marriage. We face adversity when we deal with circumstances through the workplace, through our business. Adversity is everywhere. And we struggle sometimes to overcome that adversity. And so I hope today that you're going to grab a hold of some components that will encourage your heart, that you'll find some victory and realize that you truly are an overcomer and that you can overcome adversity. Adversity hits us from different points, whether it's with our kids or it's in a special relationship or with our business or with the neighbor down the street. Adversity is everywhere. And isn't it funny how adversity seems to always be with other human beings? Isn't that weird? You know, adversity just strikes us so many different ways. But I believe that when we talked about being ready for adversity, that was a huge component. We got to understand that there is a requirement that we need to be ready for adversity. You can't just get ready for adversity when it hits you. You got to start preparing before it comes. And if we haven't faced adversity, we're going to. It's just the way the world works. It's the way that it's just this fallen world that we live in. And we looked at the life of David when he faced off with Goliath. He just wasn't ready. Just poof, became a warrior at that moment. He wasn't ready to go toe to toe with this big Philistine. He prepared. He was ready. He was a man after God's own heart. He would worship the Lord. He would sing songs, love songs to the Lord. He prepared himself for all different ways and focuses so that he was ready for the battle. And last week we talked about the idea that we need to understand when it's time to step to the line to fight and when it's time to withdraw. Because you think about this. He goes, David, who is anointed to be the future king, goes from fame of fighting Goliath. Everybody wants to be his friend. Everybody wants to know him. He's gone toe-to-toe with the big dude and taken him down, right? And now... He's got a price on his head because somebody's jealous of his fame and and he's got literally a target on his back. And so what does he do? He withdraws to the cave of Adullam. This place, the cave of Adullam means a place of refuge. And so he withdraws to the Lord and the Lord wants to teach him something. So we have to understand something. There's times we step to the battle line to fight, but there's times through the wisdom of the Lord that we have to step back and be willing to go through God's little school that we call brokenness. And God wants to prepare us through brokenness so that we're better leaders in the future. And so we looked at some of those components. But, you know, when you look at adversity, adversity comes from different vantage points, right? Next week, I want to encourage you to join us because we're going to be looking at adversity from the standpoint of what happens when you cause your own adversity. How do you get through that one, right? You know, for instance, if you, some of you have been talking to me and some of you asked me this morning, what happened to your nose? If you can't, so those of you in the back can't see, but I have this nice mark across my nose and it was pretty wide and gushing uh, last night. And I'll tell you what. I have learned that I'm sometimes my worst cause of adversity. (laughs) I'm going to share more of that story next week about what happened. But I'll tell you what, adversity comes at us either by our own hands. But what happens when adversity comes from other people? What happens when adversity hits us because somebody else made a decision or they did something and it went after us? Adversity strikes us and you're like, I don't deserve this. I didn't do this. And oftentimes we're, we're responsible for our own adversity. But what happens when stuff happens, right? When stuff happens, how do you deal with this? We learn some things, again, from David that are absolutely amazing. But first of all, I want you to get this. Look at your neighbor, okay? We're going to have some interacting time. Look at your neighbor and say, you're an overcomer. A lot of you didn't mean that. I could see it. There wasn't a lot, of, a lot of heart behind that. So for those of you that got kind of a, a droopy neighbor sitting next to you, here's the deal. You're an overcomer. You're an overcomer, and there's victory within you. And God wants to help you through that process when stuff happens. When stuff happens, you've got to understand that there's an overcomer that rests within you that is waiting to find victory. And you can find that this morning, and we can see that through the life of David, and he finds this, and it's an absolutely amazing thing. And I want us to get ready to go to 1 Samuel, so if you have your Bibles, you can start turning there to 1 Samuel. We're going to camp out there for a little bit, but remember, David goes from a place where now he's beaten Goliath, he has all this fame, and then he goes from fame 
to fugitive. He moves from fame to fugitive because now there's a price on his head and the current king, Saul, is jealous of him and is now going after him. So he's got to withdraw. So we talked about that last week, him withdrawing to the cave of Abdullam. But I want you to get this for a second. He is uh, at this point where there's even a spear thrown at him. He's almost pinned to the wall, all right, by King Saul. It's a bad day. How many like getting spears thrown at you? Nobody? Why not? It sounds like fun, doesn't it? But this is the moment that he's in. This is the adversity he is in. And so what he does is interesting. First of all, he runs to his wife. And he runs to his wife, and he's looking for help. Even his own wife looks at him saying, if you don't get out of Dodge, you're going to be dead tomorrow. That's encouraging, right? You run to your spouse, you're looking for some help, and she's like, "Uh, this is a bad day. If you want to make it another day, you got to run. So even his own wife's telling him to run. Then we see what happens is then he goes to his, uh, one of his best friends, Jonathan, who's the, the son of King Saul, and he's going to his best friend, and he goes and sees his best friend, and even his best friend is saying, this isn't good. And so he would leave his best friend not to see him again. He would then go to Samuel, the prophet who anointed him to be king, and going to his mentor to look for some advice, to look for something. And then after he leaves Samuel, he doesn't see him again. You ever been in a place of life where it seems like you're on the run and it seems like you haven't done anything to yourself, but life's coming at you from all the angles and you're just wondering where's the bottom of the barrel or where's the end of the rope and am I even going to get there because I thought I was there last week. Sometimes we get to those places and imagine David, he's gone to all these people that he loves and he thinks highly of, and now he's not going to see them again. And he's running because stuff happens. Stuff happens and it comes after him. And I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. And we're going to camp out here on this passage of scripture. And I believe we're going to find some things that are going to be an encouragement to your heart so that you realize that you're an overcomer and there's victory with inside of you. And God's going to bring that to the surface today, okay? Okay. 1 Samuel verse 30, or chapter 30, verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. David found strength in the Lord his God. I don't know about you, but I'd be distressed. I don't know about you, but I'd be a little upset with all this coming down. And imagine this moment where David's lost everything. He's lost his job, his family, his mentor, his best friend, and his dignity. Sometimes when stuff happens, we just look at it and we shake our fist and we get frustrated. We're like, this isn't fair. But when I look today, even in our church, you know, there's more to our church than just what you see around in this room. We, have a, we had a first service just about at 8.30, and, and we had people in the room too. And when we look at our body and our family, it's getting bigger and bigger, and God's blessing us. But there's adversity in the family. There's things that are coming at, and stuff happens because life's hard sometimes. Some of the things that we're faith, facing as a church family is that we have physical abuse in, with children, and we're, we're ministering to them. We have failed businesses, job loss, unfaithfulness in marriage, divorce, bills that can't be paid because there's not enough money. Body ailments, ailments and diseases. These are the things that our body, this family, as you look around this room and the room that was filled earlier this morning, that's the things that are going on in our body and our family. Adversity. Stuff happens. And when stuff happens and it's out of your control, how do you work through that? And how do you process that? How do you get with that? Well, I want to share some components from this passage of Scripture and from the life of David that I think that we're going to see some things through God's Word that we can hold on to. I'm going to give you five keys, all right, to overcoming things when stuff happens, all right? Five keys. So for those of you that like order, all right, get ready, right? One, two, three, four, five, all right? Ready? First one. This is really deep. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. And that might sound like a trivial, small children's church answer, but I'll tell you something. Often, even when I do a funeral, I will say, you have a choice today. You can either run to God or run away from God. That's what most people do. Now, we lecture children and say, go to Jesus. But we as adults, we forget this, even if we've grown up in the church. When adversity strikes and stuff happens, what do we do? We start backpedaling and go, okay, God, this is how you're going to treat me? Jerk. We throw in these little names and we start shaking our fist at God and we say, what's going on? Stuff's happening here. And in reality, we need to go to Jesus. I don't know about you, but I've been guilty of seasons in my life when adversities come, instead of going to him, I run from him. 
Don't run from him when adversity takes place. Don't run from him. And see, David doesn't lose this. David doesn't get this perspective of shaking his fist at God, but he runs to God. And we can understand that if when it, stuff happens, if we'll go to Jesus first, that's the best, the best and most valuable step that we could always take. See, there's this term, and it's not like the Urban Dictionary like I gave you last week, but there's this term that I want to give you. It's called the mumble effect. Whispering negative falsities to yourself. See, oftentimes when stuff happens, we go, that's God. He's, he doesn't like me. Or, well, I, I did this. I don't, I don't deserve this. And this is what I have. And this is what I got. And we start whispering all these false statements to ourselves about, you know what? God doesn't love me. God doesn't care. Why should I go to him anyway? And those are all complete lies from the enemy of your soul. And see, what we do is we mumble these things to ourselves, these whispers that are completely false and have no bearing because we forget that he's still God on his throne and we can still run to Jesus because of what he did for us on the cross. Amen? Amen. We've got to go to Jesus. We do this and we've taken the right step. The second thing we need to do is go to godly friends. Godly friends is what we have to run towards. See, God knows that we need friendship and we need godly friendship. Let me say this, okay? I'm gonna camp out on this for a minute, all right? This might sting a little bit for some of you, all right? But I'm apologizing for the sting ahead of time, okay? Some of you walk in and you walk right back out on a Sunday and you wonder why you don't have godly friends. You wonder why you never around the right people that are gonna encourage you and build you up and help you run after God. See, what happens is, is that if you decide to say, you know what, I don't have time to get involved with greeters or ushers or children's ministry or anything else for that matter. And I'm not asking you to serve. I'm just asking you to come and connect. Because the reality is, is some of the people that I, that I have built the greatest relationship with are the people that I've served beside. The people that I've, I count as some of the godliest friends in my life are the people that I serve side by side with. And if you are desiring godly friendship, I want to encourage you today. Don't sit on the sideline. Get involved. Serve in ministry. Be a greeter. Shake somebody's hand. Welcome them in the door. Or help pass the offering around. Or go shake a kid's hand and say, welcome to kids' church. There's so many things that you could do that help you get connected. And when you connect, you find godly friends. I just talked to a gentleman at the end when we had a great altar time at the end of the first service. And he was sharing with me that he made some poor mistakes even just this very weekend because he went to the wrong friends. He doesn't know if he's going to get in trouble or busted or whatever it is, but I'll tell you this. He's like, i got to find godly friends. And see, you can't walk in and walk out and expect to develop friendship. It just doesn't work. And the connection card is just the beginning to us starting to build the bridge to connecting with you. And so I hope that you'll take the time and connect with us beyond just the connection card because we want to know you. We want to get to connect with you. Matter of fact, next week, my wife and I, we're starting our Connection Point class where we get to hear your stories and you get to hear ours. And I hope that you'll make the time to come during the Sunday school 10 o'clock hour. I hope that you make the time because that's where godly friendships are created and built as a foundation so that we can be encouraging to each other. Because here's the thing, when you have godly friends, it speaks truth and light into your life. You need that. You and I both need that. See, we've got to have that. We so desperately need it. And let me give you an example out of scripture. Think about Judas and Peter, okay? Judas betrays Jesus, right? And what happens after Judas betrays Jesus? He runs off all by himself and he hangs himself. Peter denied Jesus three times. And what happens to Peter? He runs back to his friends. They're all meeting in the upper room together after all this has come and said and done. But he goes back to friends. And when he goes back to friends, he might have turned his back for a moment on Jesus, but he found godly friends that encouraged their lives. And now they were the foundation that changed the world because we see it in the gospel, the Bible. See, there's a difference. Judas ran to be by himself. It didn't end up so well for him. And you think you can run off by yourself, it's not going to end up well. And I'm not saying you're going that far as Judas, but I'm telling you, you're missing it. You're missing opportunity for your second, third, and fourth chance. And encouragement to speak truth and light into your life. Don't be like Judas. Be like Peter. And go to godly friends. It'll bring life to you. It'll help you connect. All right, the third thing is, don't give in to bitterness, fear, or negativity. 
Well, when adversity comes, that's easier said than done, isn't it? If we want to shake our fist at God, we, instead of running to him, we run away from him. We get mad. We tell our friends, those that, whether they're godly or not, God doesn't like me. This is the way it is. Stuff happens. This is horrible. Anybody feel that way? Just me? Okay. We get there, though, don't we? This is the perspective where we've got to begin to shift things. Because remember we talked about being discontented? And we talked about that passage of scripture last week. And discontented in the Hebrew means bitter of soul. See, we get discontented because we feel wronged. We feel like this wasn't fair. And so what happens, we develop bitterness within us. And bitterness creates something that pushes us naturally away from God. Because we cast the blame on him. Again, the mumble effect takes over. And we listen to false statements. See, there's something powerful when we can start looking at the glass as half full instead of half empty. You know who I'm talking to. Some of you in the room, you're just naturally optimistic, aren't you? My wife, who I just tease her all the time and says she's, you know, she's kind of be pessimistic sometimes. She goes, no, 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 I'm a realist. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some of us need to understand, though, that as we grow in our relationship with the Lord, optimism becomes something that just bubbles over in us. We start to believe in the impossible. We start to believe that if we anoint somebody with oil, they're going to be healed. We start to believe that God can do the supernatural. Optimism starts bubbling over in us. But those of us that think that the glass is half empty, we start for forgetting that God can do the impossible. Uh, let me tell you something. He split the sea. He divided the Jordan. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Hello? I got to tell you, the first service was much more lively than you guys. <laughs> and that's not always the case. Usually, guys, you're a little bit more uppity up here. I'm telling you, optimism bubbles over when you understand the God that you serve. When you go to him, instead of run away from him, something changes in us. Amen? Amen. We get optimistic. And see, here's what David does. He writes this Psalms in the midst of all this. When he could have been bitter and frustrated and angry, he doesn't let that come about him. Look at what he writes in Psalm 34. He writes these words in the season of his life, starting at verse one. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. These are the words that David writes in the midst of stuff happening. Because he said, you know what? I'm not going to let myself get bitter. I'm not going to get full of fear. I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to declare who my God is over my things and my situation and my circumstances. Stuff may happen, but I know where I am with the Lord. That's an amazing attitude. See, we've got to remember that we've got to go to Jesus. Don't run from him we got to remember that we need to go to godly friends because they're going to speak truth and life into us. And if you don't have them, now's the time to start building those relationships. And as you build that, you've got to remember that the glass isn't half empty. It's half full. And God will do miraculous things through you because remember what I said, you're an overcomer. And there's victory within you and God's looking to bring it to the surface. So grab a hold of it and let it come to the surface because God wants to do extraordinary things in you. Amen? All right, number four, learn all that we can. See, when stuff happens, we've got to take advantage of the difficult situations. Because, see, when difficult times come, did you know you're more open to change than any other time in your life? When difficult times and seasons come in your life, you're more open to change. Now, here's what I know. I said this also in first service, okay? So don't feel like I'm picking on you alone. In case you didn't know, you're stubborn. Some of you are looking at me like, "Uh uh-uh, he did not just say that. (laughs) Here's the deal. Maybe you're not a native South Dakotan, but South Dakotans are stubborn. 
And if you live here long enough, you become stubborn. We do. We just become stubborn. We put our roots in deep. We're like, no, I'm not going to change. I don't like change. I don't want change. But what God does is when adversities come, he doesn't cause the adversity, but he will definitely take advantage of the adversity and he will allow change to come in because you're more open to change than at any other time when stuff happens. And when stuff happens and you're open to change, God can do amazing things in us. Because when we don't like change, we don't like to give up our seat. When we don't like change, we're not willing to go to new places with the Lord. When we don't like change, we're not willing to step out in faith and pray that somebody gets healed. But when stuff happens, we're open to change. So we have something to learn. What is it that God wants to teach you when stuff happens? Remember I talked last week that we got to know what side of school we're on? We're not always the one schooling. We're the one that's the student sometimes, like David. What's God wanting to teach you? You've got to learn something here and understand that he's teaching us something that's absolutely amazing. And sometimes it's simple as change. Change is good for us. Now, change isn't always easy, but change is good. You know, your cell phone's already outdated, even if you bought it yesterday. See, the reality is, is that things always do change. And I want you to know this. God and who he is and all of his principles never change. But he wants to change you because guess what? You and I got a lot of growing to do. We've got a lot of learning to do. So be open to the change. Be open to it when stuff happens because God wants to teach us something amazing. It's huge when we get ourselves into his presence and we worship him and we go to him and we accompany that with godly friends and we realize that we don't need to get bitter and angry and full of fear and we simply learn what God wants to teach us in those moments. All right, number five, plant new seeds. Plant new seeds. See, this is something that I think many of us get wrong when stuff happens. When adversity comes, see, we might be able to say, okay, I can go to Jesus. Yeah, I can go to some godly friends. Yeah, I'll see what I need to learn through the situation. But we forget this one, and this one's the hardest one of them all, to plant new seeds. See, there's this amazing moment that happens If you've read the Gospels very much, there's this interaction between two people, Jesus and John the Baptist. See, they were related, and there's a spiritual connection because John the Baptist was called to prepare the way for the Messiah, to prepare the way for the hearts of man. And he goes and he prepares the way. So there's a kindred spirit thing, and then something's fulfilled when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. There's this amazing spiritual connection, this thing where God looks down from heaven, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And see, what happens in this moment is that there's this connection, there's this love, and there's this bond, there's this relationship. Because remember, they're also related. And so what happens is, is that later on, John the Baptist is imprisoned. And in his imprisonment, he ends up becoming beheaded, which is just a bad day, in case you didn't know that. It just doesn't end well for him. And when it ends bad, what happens is, is that Jesus, because of his connection with John, he's grieving. He's hurt. Stuff just happened. See, life hit him and it made him sad. So what we see in scripture is that Jesus withdrew. But after he withdrew, something amazing happened. Now he went to his father like we're supposed to go to him. Take note of that. But what happens after he withdraws is that he gets right back on to what God had called him to do. He starts delivering the demon possessed. He starts healing the sick. He starts preaching the good news. He starts proclaiming the kingdom of God. This is where Jesus has it, and we need to learn something, is that he went out and started planting seeds for the kingdom. See, when adversity comes, often what we do is we take our seeds and we trample them on the ground with our own bitterness and anger. And what God is asking us to do is say, no, 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 withdraw to me. Let me strengthen you, but go and fulfill the task that I've provided for you to do. And Jesus goes out and he plants new seed, and the kingdom advances in the midst of, of stuff happening. See, oftentimes we don't do that. We get mad, we throw our seed down, and we say, forget it. I've been hurt. I, I helped once in ministry, but, you know, people are mean, and I don't want to do that again. You know, I, I, I tried to, to teach a Sunday school class once, and it was bad. Kids were all crazy, and it just wasn't good. I didn't know enough about the Bible. And we start making all these excuses. And instead, what God's asking us to do in the midst of our adversity is to face it and plant new seed. 
don't walk away from the moment and the opportunity, and we can see it as Jesus does, in the midst of a loss of somebody who loved, he loved dearly. He says, no, I have a task at hand, and I'll plant new seed. See, the enemy will shove things in your face all the time, whether it's losing a loved one, whether it's facing a death or an illness or anything like that, whether it's losing a job. See, the enemy's going to come at you and go, see, you'll never overcome. You'll never have victory, so don't even bother. And see, that's the enemy whispering into your heart saying, you're never going to measure up, so just stop while you're ahead. And what the reality is is that God's saying, no, plant seed in the midst of stuff happening. Plant seed in the midst of your adversity. And see that I won't store, throw open the storehouses of heaven. I will open up the heavens and I will do a miracle. I will do amazing things in you and through you. Plant some new seed. You know what I love about Bethel is that we believe in planting seed. We believe in sowing seed. We believe in being a part of what God's doing, not only here in Rapid City, but around the world. We have missionaries that we support. And I know we've been starting to share some of those things with you, but we have missionaries that we support all around the world because sometimes we can't all, uh, we're not all called and we're not all called to get on a plane and go live in another country and share the gospel and teach and preach and all those things. And we don't always do that, but we, through your faithfulness and your giving, we're able to support missionaries all around the world and we're advancing the kingdom even right now at this very moment. That's an amazing thing to think about. And as we think about that, there are missionaries that we're supporting, there's missionaries that we've supported, and there's a legacy being built. Matter of fact, I want to share with you a legacy that I think is just absolutely amazing. Uh, there's some missionaries that we supported uh, a long time ago, and it's made a huge difference in the world. Uh, Monroe Grams, and I had the privilege of meeting him, and I'm going to pick on him, and just don't get mad at me, sir. Um, he's a veteran missionary who has served, and we supported him here at Bethel. And he's here in the service, and you'll see him in just a moment. But Monroe Grahams went out as a missionary to Bolivia in 1952. His wife, Betty Jane, sister of Mary Ellen Dahlberg, and many of you know the Dahlbergs, accompanied him. The Grahams ministered in Bolivia for 16 years. He was a church planner and started two Bible schools. In 1970, they moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina. Monroe directed Latin America Advanced School of Theology and traveled all over Latin America, training pastors, missionaries, and leaders. Monroe's daughter, Mona Shields, is now the co-director of this ministry alongside her husband, Mike Shields. We support the Shields today monthly. There's a legacy being stepped down. There's seeds planted. His son, Rocky Grams, who we also support monthly as a missionary here, is the Bible school director of Buenos Aires in Argentina. See, the reality is, is this, is that I introduced to you Pastor Stephen and Rachel Seibley, our superintendents. See, that's Rachel's dad. See, the reality is, is this. I haven't met a missionary yet that hasn't faced adversity. I haven't met a missionary yet that didn't come across hard times and a broken heart and a broken spirit at one point or another. But what they said is, I will still plant seed. See, he lost his wife in 2000, and now he's here with his new wife, Clemencia, who's accompanying him today along with the Shibleys, and I'll tell you what, they still have a heart. And I, 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 met, uh, I met Monroe in the foyer, and he's already just encouraged me, Pastor, you're doing a great job. It's so great to be here. And I mean, he's speaking into my life. And the thing is, is that what I've seen in missionaries that blow my mind is that they'll always plant seed, no matter what the adversity is, no matter what comes their way. And I'll tell you something, we can learn from David, but we also can learn from missionaries that we support all around the world, is that, you know what, when adversity comes, you run to God. You go to godly friends. You don't get bitter and angry. You learn all that you can, and you never stop planting seeds. You know, many of you don't know, but my wife loves to paint, and uh, maybe, maybe it's her stress relief from me, I don't know. Um, but she loves to paint, and she painted this for you, Monroe. And here's the thing. Because you said, I'm going to plant seed, your children are carrying on the very ministries that you birthed and you started. Because you said, I'm not going to let adversity get us down, and there's new life behind everything. So thank you for being faithful and modeling for us planting seed. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Good word. There's an overcomer in you, though. And there's a victorious person that's within you that can plant the same seeds and leave the same legacy as Monroe, who can overcome adversity just like David. And when stuff happens, you don't have to throw in the towel. You don't have to run from God. You can make a difference and you can make a massive impact. But you have to choose today to say, God, I'm going to run to you. And when stuff happens, I'm going to learn all that I can. And I'll never stop planting seed. Would you stand with me this morning? Some of you in this room, you felt like, what's the point? I'm not David. What's the point? I'm not called to Argentina or Bolivia or any other country. I just live in Rapid City. I mean, what's the point? As I've spoke this morning, some of you have said that in your mind. And you've mumbled things and whispered things to your heart that are saying, I'm not an overcomer. I don't have victory. There's nothing for me. My life is full of stuff happening. And it just doesn't measure up. Here's what I believe. I believe the enemy is just lying to you. And there's an overcomer inside. I believe that within you, there's victory. Sometimes all you have to do is take the first step and say, you know what? I'm going to Jesus. See, the word of God says, I overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. The blood of the lamb that was sacrificed on a cross by my testimony that I and myself, I don't measure up. But through Jesus, I do. There's victory. Some of you have been told for so long, you're worthless. You'll never make it. I'm here today to tell you they're wrong. And that you're a victorious overcomer. And when stuff happens, you can make it. But if you'll take hold of these things and run to Jesus, let godly friends be in your life and learn something and not get bitter and plant some seed, you'll find victory. Here's what I want to ask. This morning, if you're here and you feel like, you know what? <laughs> I don't feel like an overcomer. I don't have victory. Maybe it's been a while since you ran to Jesus or maybe you got that part down, but as the stuff gets deeper and it gets harder, you never make it to planting seed. If that's you, I believe God wants to minister to you this morning. I believe that he wants to lavish his love upon you. And I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm gonna ask you to step out and come up here and stand at the altar with me. And we're gonna pray over you and we're gonna just agree with you that God's gonna do the miraculous. He's gonna bring you out of defeat and into victory. I believe God wants to show you that you're an overcomer. And I believe there's some of you in this room and I've been praying for this moment. I want you to step out right now and come up here. Don't let the enemy steal from you. Come on. There's more of you. Take back your victory and become the overcomer that God wants you to be.
I'm a patient person. And I believe there's still a few more. You're struggling in your heart. You've been wrestling in your mind. And when I've made these statements today, you've struggled with this fact that I don't overcome. I don't have victory. The altar's open for you. Don't miss it. This is where we're the church and we're friends and we're family. I don't want one person standing alone up here. So if there's somebody you know, somebody you want to stand with, I want you to come and stand with them. Not one of us should be alone because this is where we go to godly friends and we fight together. We find victory together. Come on, I need more of you up here. Come on, church, be the family. Be the family. Can we just have an attitude of prayer? I believe God wants to do some stuff this morning. You'll get out of here in a few minutes. Lunch is still waiting. You'll be okay. I want you to start praying. Start praying, church. Come on. I want you to pray out loud. Sometimes we don't know how to pray because we've never heard somebody pray. Start praying out loud for our friends. If you're standing with somebody up here at the front, I want you to start praying out loud. Let them hear the encouragement of the Lord. Lord, right now we pray for our friends. We pray that you would release heaven over them right now, that you would encourage them, that they would know that they are called, that they are victorious, that they are overcomers this morning. I pray that you move in their heart, you move in their life, and that, God, you will lift their spirit, that, God, they will look to you to find help and salvation and hope this morning in Jesus' name. I pray that the lies of the enemy be broken in the name of Jesus, that they will not be heard, they will not be believed, that they will hear a good report, and it's the report of the Lord, that they will lean on the Lord and the Lord alone in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Come on, press in and pray, church. We're not done. There's one of you up here, then you're struggling and you're, you feel like your past, it just won't go away. You feel like your past just keeps defining you over and over again. And you feel like, well, this is what I am and this is how I'm made and this is all it's going to be. That's not true. Your past doesn't define you. It may have put some arrows in your shield of faith, but it doesn't define you. You may have a scar from your past, but it does not define you. I don't know which one you are, but you feel like your past defines you. And that is wrong. From this moment forward, your future is what defines you. Your future with Jesus. Your future with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask something a little bit. Who's struggling with their past? Who is it, honey? Okay. Is there anyone else? Who's the past coming after? Okay, come stand here with her. Come here, bud. The past is the past. It's over. It doesn't define you. And right now, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I want you to say, I let go of the past. And I take holy, hold of only Christ in my future. The past doesn't define you anymore. You're a new creation through Christ. Let the word of God pour over you. Let the truth be in you. 
you know the truth. Take hold of it, brother. Let's pray. Father, right now I pray for my friends. I pray that their past would be broken from them in the name of Jesus. I pray that it would not haunt them, that it would not come around at night, that it would not come around when they're alone. I pray that their past be as far away as the east is from the west. I pray, God, that your anointing, your power, and your love and your future would be the only thing on their mind. Lord, I pray that when the enemy whispers about their past, Lord, that they will know that they are a new creation. I pray that the word of God will soak over their mind and their soul, and they they will know the truth, and the truth will set them free from their past. Today, they are new. Today, they take hold of their future. And I pray in the name of Jesus that they be set free and walk in victory. Lord, we plead the precious blood of your Savior over them. God, we ask that you anoint them and remove the arrows of the evil one that have been stuck within them. I pray that their faith would arise and God, they'll take hold of the task at hand. And I pray that you set them free from the lies of the enemy and they'll walk in victory. I pray that you make them overcomers in the name of Jesus, that they will walk in victory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Thank you for your patience. Allow me to just pray a blessing over you. And let's go today knowing that we're victorious overcomers because we've ran to him and we'll never stop planting seed. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for everyone in this room. I pray that your Holy Spirit will go before them and come behind them, that you'll give them everything and anything that they need. And Lord, today I pray that you be with them and be upon them. God, I pray that you will just lavish them with your love and your presence. God, I pray that you would bless them in their relationships, that God, you would bless them in their homes and in their business and in their job. I pray that your abundance would be upon them. And God, I pray as they go today that they will know that they are victorious overcomers through the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We worship you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an incredible Sunday and we'll see you next week.